Welcome to the Plant-Based Podcast. Did you know that plants are truly amazing? Not only can you grow them and eat them, you can also wear them, drink them, nourish your skin with them, and so much more. Let Ellen and Michael inspire you to love plants as much as they do, as they chat with the movers and shakers in this wonderful plant-based world. So, let's dig in. Brought to you with Lava Light. Whether you're a novice gardener, specialist grower, or houseplant enthusiast, Lava Light can help you to nourish and protect your plants all year round. The collection comprises of eight different horticultural growing media and pest control products, with each continually offering the same natural benefits from thermal protection and moisture retention to soil conditioning and continued nutrient boosts. Derived from volcanic deposits, Lava Light is completely natural and sustainable. Look out for it online and in your local gardening stores. So today's episode is with Megan Webb, who specialises in the propagation and research of carnivorous plants. And having built up a collection of hundreds of plants as a foundation to that very research, I'm wondering what Megan's house must look like. (laughs) <laughs> From sundews to Saracenia, Megan is here to tell us all about her passion for these pest-eating plants. And she's also going to give us some tips on how to care for them at home. So welcome to the podcast, Megan. Thank you. It's great to be here, you two. Well, no, it's brilliant. I, I love there was a flurry on, Li- I think it was on LinkedIn a week ago, and you got loads of coverage because Hannah from Perrywood was talking about you, a couple of other people. And it was like, whoa, Megan's arrived on the carnivorous plant media scene. And it was, it was brilliant. We, <laughs> yeah, and we love seeing the ambition, and that's why you're here today anyway. So Yeah, absolutely. It's very, very cool. So, Megan, where do we start? Let's start maybe from the very beginning. Loads of us had Venus flytraps as a child, right? Like I definitely did. Um, is that where your love of carnivorous plants started from, or where mm. did it all start? Um, so yeah, basically, I was twelve when it all started, and I must admit, it was very new to me because I had no interest in plants at all before that age, um, or mm. any kind of plants. I didn't even know about carnivorous plants before then. Um, but my nan, she likes plants. She kept plants in her garden and kept giving me snippets from um, horticultural magazines. And in one of those magazines was a snippet of um, some Venus flytraps and, you know, just a, re- a rough description. Um, this article was selling them and I found them really interesting. Mm-hmm. So next time that um, I went to be in queue with my parents, I picked one up and was determined to grow one. Um, but then, like many people, when they first start out, I did kill it <laughs> quite um, you know, with <laughs> as well. But I don't know, it was something like that. And I think it was the first time because usually, you know, at that age, you try something, and if it's not that great, then you just forget it, move on. But I was determined to get the whole carnivorous plant fever as you know, it was going around because I found it so interesting. So I got something easier. And that's where it started. I just didn't stop from there. And as you probably know from, you know, my collection now, that is just built over the last nine years. So that's kind of how it all started. It was really spontaneous, I must admit. So at what point, so what were you then studying at school? Because you've then done a degree in horticulture. So kind of what was your, what was your next move and how many plants did you have at each stage? (laughs) (laughs) Um, right. So it's actually really weird because even then I still didn't want to go down the plant route. I mm. went through. Why, why is that? Can I ask before we move on? I don't know. I think it's because my mm. parents like, you know, the family that I'm right. Other than my nan, everyone in my family doesn't like plants. They mm-hmm. think they're messy. Right. They attract pests, you know. Mm-hmm. So it was never a thing that I found interesting. And even at school, like when I had mentioned to a couple of my friends that I'd got this plant, they were like, mm-hmm. oh, plants, that's weird. So they were like, you know, it was one of those things where I was like, okay, I won't really mention it. I wouldn't delve into it, thought about it or anything like that. So I went through high school. Even when I got to college, I didn't take a horticultural course. I did photography, sociology and, you know, stuff that just interested me. Mm -hmm. Um, But then when I was at college, I needed a work experience placement. And the only thing that I could think of that was near me and was potentially plant-like at this stage, I had probably, I don't know, around 15 to 20 carnivorous mm-hmm. plants at this point mm-hmm. um so that hadn't stopped it's not like i've given up of that 
But I thought, <laughs> oh, I'll try down the actual horticultural route because I hadn't looked into that before. Went to do Beth Chateau's for a year. This was when I was mm-hmm. 18. And I was there for a whole year, um, just volunteering there, doing bits in the gardens. Really, really enjoyed the propagation and research side to things. So I did that a lot while I was there. And then it was, again, another spontaneous decision. It was literally the week I had applied for uni, but I had no intention of going. And it was for a horticultural course. It was either going to be horticultural or English, Mm -hmm. um, because I love writing. But then it was literally the last week before we were meant to start uni. I decided I'm going to go to uni, did a horticulture course. And that, again, that's that's where I start picking up. And then since starting uni and finding out so much more, is when my whole passion for plants and carnivorous plants started mm-hmm. and then I just didn't, you know, stop collecting carnivorous plants in particular. You are a spontaneous person, Megan. <laughs> Very spontaneous and still to this day it baffles me when people ask me, oh, but something must have triggered it. Yeah. No, <laughs> I really can't remember. You know, there's nothing really that was a determining factor. Nobody really helped me with that decision. Mm-hmm. Nobody, you know, encouraged me to go down that course. It just happened mm-hmm. so randomly because before that I wanted to do animals you know pets and stuff because my mum was an animal breeder so I was just mm-hmm. like oh I'll go down the animal side last minute literally last week this all got decided in one it's, so. it's the universe Megan from that very first oh. kind of risk plant that you had when you were younger that did spark that interest in you so you were just like being led along the path to horticulture one way or another even if you resisted it a little bit along the way to do other things so well, we're very pleased that you did it and you're here <laughs> yeah I'm really glad because it's something weird now because I would never go back from it like I it got, got this far and I don't see that I could ever give it up, which is still mm-hmm. really random because, you know, it was never my top passion. I think it's always good to follow your instincts. And I think probably before I've talked on the podcast, I don't believe in kind of having these five year plans or looking ahead too much because you have to just kind of follow what feels right at the time and be reactive. And too many people aren't. They kind of they don't follow opportunities that are in front of them because they got some massive plan beyond it. And sometimes, you, yeah, you just got to follow what feels right at the time and you obviously have which is really cool <laughs> where, where were you studying by the way um i studied at Rishel, um, ah, cool. yeah, Rishel cool. university college did the um three years horticultural honors degree yeah uh-huh yeah. and since then what, what have you been up to um so i graduated last year mm-hmm. um um in may and i basically got offered a full-time contract at perry woods hence mm-hmm. why i stayed because cool. whilst i was at uni i did part-time there just at weekends and then yeah. did a full-time role in the summer um and again this was all just pretty around mainly you know needed the money needed to um get more into it perry woods really helped with plant identification okay, uh, yeah, yeah, you know you did a bit of uni but mm-hmm. you know getting it hands-on doing it daily really helped yeah um, and then since graduating uni, I guess, you know, I just worked full time. I didn't really know what my next steps were. I didn't really have one path that I could think of. But when I, I it was at the end of last year that I got uh, notified that I'd won the Abba Conway Award, mm-hmm. um, which is for under 30s um, based on their thesis and dissertations. And I didn't even know that Rittle had nominated me for this. Mm-hmm. And to win it <laughs> was, you know, a real big opportunity you know just to get myself out there in a way my name was out there and what I'd done because my dissertation was about carnivorous plants as well it was something so unique and even when I won the award it's something that you know no one's ever done before so I think that was my determining factor to then go well I want to basically get myself out there teach other people what carnivorous plants are and what other people can do so obviously I'm in quite a good I guess position because I'm a little bit younger as well there's not many people of my age who even do carnivorous plants mainly all um older people lots of males are in this kind of hobby as well so it was kind of that that was my deciding factor that I wanted to do stuff hence why I make, I've done so much this year in a way of making my own blogs done so many YouTube videos mm-hmm. um you know Instagram LinkedIn everything that I could to try and get myself out there and it's still building now but the people that you meet doing this is such a great feeling and opportunity to mm-hmm. meet other people in the plant communities obviously like you two freelancers mm. you know it's great to see what you two do and that's kind of what I would like to strive to get myself out to do as well 
So I really love that you've got like that ambition and drive and you're also like paving your own way. Like you've found mm. that your love for carnivorous plants and then you can see that there's kind of a space for you there, you know, to do something with and to fly mm. the flag, not just for younger people, but but also for women. Like you say, there is a lot of male um, males that work in breeding, especially and, and specializing. So this is a great opportunity, you know, for you to to really make your mark on the industry. So we I feel kind of privileged that you're on the podcast, Megan. Well, yeah, well, well you're, you. you're making it happen. And we're, we're here yeah. to ask you like tips about plants today. But kind of uh, just before we move on, I know we have got a few more questions to ask you about plants specifically. But what kind of because for a lot of people like Ellen, I think you'll agree, they kind of they want to do all the things you're doing. They want to make videos for social media. They want to get out there. But sometimes they hold themselves back and what what because nothing seems to stop you like what is the kind of magic formula because I know some people worry that like their friends are then following them and they won't want to see videos about plants or this and that and and I always say to them just just forget it just block your friends remove them from social media or get rid of your family like how how do you get over that obstacle because it can be an obstacle for someone just starting in social media can't it like oh what will my friends think what will my family think you get yeah, I think the first thing that I did is I started my YouTube channel in 2019, which was a year mm. into uni. And um, you probably won't believe this, but I was the shyest person in mm. the world. I would not talk to anyone. Like to do this now is, you know, massive. Yeah. Like when I started work for the first time, all that would not talk to anyone. And for me to do a YouTube video alone and put it on social media, because I had no social media before this yeah. was, you know, crazy. But it was actually the people I met at uni that encouraged me. I made a really good friend at uni and he basically, he did YouTube himself before them. And he was just like, you know, what you do is amazing. He goes, I've never met anyone like you. You need to do, you know, a YouTube video. And I was like, oh, I couldn't do that. So I thought I'd make a practice one. I did one in my greenhouse. I showed it to him first and he goes, we got to post it. He goes, it's such, you know, even though it was four minutes long and it's very simple. I didn't show my face, but I did speak in it. And I was like, that's how it started. Then after that, I made an Instagram account, posted a couple of pictures. And then you get people from plant communities or people that comment on your stuff. It's not always going to be positive. And that does mm -hmm. tear me a little bit. But at the same mm -hmm. time, there's so many people that I've met or so many people that have said such nice things. Mm. Um, again, what everybody's kind of said to me is such a unique and such a passion. Mm. You know, you need these kind of people um, in the world to do this kind of stuff. So the people that I've met along the way have really encouraged me to continue. Like you just need that one person every now and again, even if it's once a year, once a month, whatever, just to say, I really like what you do. And I don't think the people realize how much that makes an impact on what you do. And I think that's the reason why I've continued now, because you could have those days where, you know, you've got the negative bits coming in, but then you get a message or something on your Instagram or on your videos and they go, really like this you've helped me grow plants and you go I need to continue this mm -hmm. and you know that's why I've, I think I've just continued and then I've built it to a point now though I'm trying to get out there as much as possible and I've met so many lovely people along the way oh I love that so basically, basically so yeah totally yeah. you know like Michael said so many people want to do it but just don't really know where to start or how to start mm -hmm. and I think the answer to that is you've got to just do it you kind of got to battle yeah. through it and do it you know and it, it's all for the love of plants and it is I know that sounds totally cheesy but what you're doing is for the love of carnivorous plants at the end of the day and it's encouraging more people you know to to get involved with plants so that's so cool so before we even get into talking about um tips for uh, growing carnivorous plants and the like I'm still so intrigued to know about your personal collection of plants like what does it look like how many species do you have you've mm. gone from having one to having 15 to having hundreds so where are they all <laughs> um so I have two eight by six greenhouses full to the brim to put I have no space <laughs> left um I use square pots to maximize space and I've got giant trays and shelving the lot um so that's all full and then I have two plant stands indoors um which are the for the more tender plants that can't deal with the frost but practically most of my collection is outside 
species wise lost count i have got so many multiple genus i've got all the basic ones that you see from garden centers like saracenia pinuiculus but i've also started delving into more rarer or difficult to look after mm. so recent years i've got to like raw radula drosophyllums and stuff like that which people may have never heard of which are just so unique and that's another thing is promoting stuff that people haven't heard of like when you think of kind of response so you think of a Venus flytrap or you think of a pitcher plant or, you know, anything like that. But, you know, to then delve into something unique and be able to grow it is another great privilege, another reason why I'm, you know, I want to continue because there's so much to learn in this hobby alone. Definitely. What would be, what would you say is the most surprising plant that you've got? Because, of course, insect eating plants they all trap insects in many many different ways so i wonder if first of all just for listeners can you explain just the top line of why carnivorous plants do what they do roughly how they do it and then some of the more unique ones you've got in your collection it'd be good if you okay. could just talk through <laughs> <Yeah>. those for us <laughs> um so basically the reason that carnivorous plants have um obviously evolved to do insect eating is basically due to nutrition um, deficiencies within their natural habitats where they live like peat bogs and fens have no nutrients they're very high in carbon and nitrogen so mm -hmm. the plants over the years have adapted to have another source to get nutrients from obviously the atmosphere is basically by creating traps so that be pictures snap traps sticky leaves or anything like that and then the definition basically of a carnivorous plant is it must absorb and trap capture and kill a insect for reproduction and growth purposes so obviously you see plants out there which you know may drown insects or anything but they're not necessarily carnivorous because they actually need to capture kill and use it for digestive purposes mm -hmm. so that gives them the additional nutrients that they wouldn't usually get in their natural environment hence why it's kind of you know you need to get their soil levels right in obviously a hobby is because you can't just use houseplant compost because it's got too many nutrients they've evolved to such a point now that you know they still have to be in what you would find in the wild but they've still got to see their traps and all that, everything else which obviously gives them the more characteristic mm -hmm. and lovable kind of thing that everybody finds is a great trait for these uh, unique plants mm -hmm. um so you know based on that that's the reason why and obviously they have adapted to basically where their location is what would suit them best with mm -hmm. capturing and digestion so some it's you know quick like the venus flytrap it snaps shut to find prey fast others are more slower like a grocer for example sundews they will capture them on sticky leaves and then fill them up and then digest them more slowly. So it depends, you know, what kind of suits their environment and how much nutrients they need is based on what um, traps they have in, obviously, adapted to. Cool. Wow. That's so cool. Do you know what I was just thinking? I, like, if they've evolved, you know, in order to trap and digest, you know, bugs, whatever, what were they like before? I like... Like, what were they like in the first place? Do you know what I mean? Years ago, before they'd evolved because then they're not growing in nutrient-rich environments. Like, what were they then? So, basically, there's um, if you know, some of the um, scientific families like behind carnivorous plants are very similar to plants that we have now. So, um, some of the plants, um, going back to my dissertation days now, um, mm -hmm. are related to basically even some like succulent kind of related families. It's some really weird families that you've got of plants today. And carnivorous plants land under those families of other plants. So, some of the plants are really closely related to some other non-carnivorous plants. And that is probably what they kind of look like today. So, your common house plants that you would see in stores, some of the more tropical house plants may have looked like that before obviously evolving into what you see today so in that terms not many people know what they look like but that is what based on their families they probably look like hi i'm the gardener ben and thank you so much for joining me for my second contribution towards the plant-based podcast Last month, you heard me talking about getting the garden all sorted and tidied in January. And now that February has arrived, it's time to really crack on with some really important jobs. February sees the beginning of the spring bulbs, and the first of those is always the snowdrops. These tenacious little hardy bulbs pushing their way through often frozen and snowy soil, poking their beautiful nodding heads above ground. 
this is the perfect opportunity to split them up. I like to do this just as they flower, so I can enjoy them in their new growing positions. Over a period of years, snowdrops can get really quite congested and stop multiplying. So it's best to lift them at least every three years, divide the clumps up into no more than four or five bulbs and replant them into different locations. By doing this in the green, the bulbs transplant and survive much better than buying them in bulb form from, for instance, a garden centre or online. The bulbs are so tiny, often the size of a garden pea, that they don't last above ground for very long. So the most cost-effective way and the most successful way of transplanting them is the traditional way in the green, by lifting, dividing and replanting. These little bulbs are surprisingly deep-rooted, so do make sure when you lift the clumps you get well underneath the bulbs and leave as much roots intact as possible. Very quickly, over a period of five, six or seven years, you can make sure that you've got snowdrops absolutely everywhere for you to enjoy from the month of February all the way through to the end of March. Out in the garden, I've also now completed all of my rose pruning and it's now time to build obelisks and plant supports. I've been doing this uh, as a series of online tutorials, which has been really very most enjoyable. But Growing roses like Claire Austin and the Wedgwood Rose from David Austin Roses as statement pieces on pillars or obelisks is really rewarding. Instead of growing the rose straight up a wall or a fence, you can bring it right to the edge of a border and enjoy it from 360 degrees, which I believe is really, really beautiful. It's also time to start getting organised with some DIY jobs around the garden. I like in the month of February to bring the garden benches into the garage, allow them to dry for a couple of weeks and then start cleaning them up. It's always a perfect time of year to give them a new lick of paint and make sure they're ready for the season ahead. Not that I ever get much time to sit on the garden benches, but it's nice to have them looking smart, clean and tidy anyway. After ebbing a little bit during the month of January, it's now time to start sowing seeds. And if you're planning on growing sweet peas like I do, of exhibition quality, February is the perfect time of year to start sowing them. Follow my guide on how to chit and sow sweet peas, which I'm doing in a stage-by-stage -stage guide, here on Instagram and, of course, on YouTube. Basically, it involves popping the seeds in to soak into lukewarm, room-tepid water for around 36 to 72 hours. Sweet peas being from the legume family have really hard outer coatings to their seeds and have problems germinating at low temperatures. And if you're growing under glass in a very mildly heated greenhouse, they can often rot before they actually grow. So chitting them in warm water just softens their outer coating and allows them just to push through that tap root. Germination normally takes around 7 to 14 days and very soon you'll have a series of lots of little plants that you can start bringing on very, very slowly. Once your sweet peas have put on around three or four true leaves, it's time to pinch them out and move them into an unheated coal frame. They're going to need quite a lot of food moving forward and they love an iron seaweed feed around once every fortnight. Once I've sowed the sweet peas, it's time to start thinking about the other crops which take a little more time to get going and need a much longer growing season. So during the month of February, I'll be starting my tomatoes, my loofahs and my aubergines off in the greenhouse. I think it's really important for the amateur garden to really slow themselves down in the month of February. And I'm often having to remind people online that you need to have planned your plant's next steps to grow successfully. Please don't hurry into growing things on windowsills and in the house when things only take several weeks to get established. You will end up, for instance, with a large tomato plant or cucumber with no next steps and nowhere to go. As a result, these plants often get leggy and weak, spindly and produce very little fruit. You're often better being late to the party than you are early and starting your seedlings off much, much later in the year. February is also the perfect time to get out and do some jet washing. 
This is not a job I enjoy doing in the garden. It's slow, arduous and very, very boring. But once it's done, your paths, patios and paving will not only be much safer once you've removed the algae and slime from the winter, but also look much smarter and cleaner. On a more personal note, here in the North Lodge Cottage Garden, we're moving forward with our last huge garden project. This will involve around seven tonnes of random walling rockery stone to be delivered from a local quarry, nearly 30 metres of sandstone paving and the installation of a vintage water tank which I located close to home, which is a staggering eight feet by four feet and three feet deep. The tank itself weighs over half a tonne and will contain over three cubic metres, topped with a beautiful monolith water feature stone, all set above ground. I've got a really busy couple of months ahead of me, so join me again in March here on the Plant Based Podcast. I'm The Gardener Ben, where you can find me across Instagram, TikTok, YouTube and Facebook. I'll see you all soon. Enjoy the rest of the month of February. Hi, it's me, Ellen Mary. I'm here to tell you all about people, plants, wellbeing, where you can find your magic through the power of plants and nature. We have a wellbeing retreat coming up on the 21st to the 23rd of April. It's in Norfolk in the UK, and it's all about reconnecting, resetting, and rejuvenating yourself through immersive nature experiences. There's going to be guided walks, there's going to be foraging talks and walks, bathing under the stars, evening time walks, mindful gardening sessions, plants and crafts, plant-based foods. Everyone's going to feed off the amazing group energy, and it's all set in private woodland. It is going to be epic you can even get a massage you can opt in for a reiki session or hypnotherapy as well so check it out peopleplantswellbeing.com click on wellbeing retreats and you'll find all the information you need to join us on the wild wellbeing retreat i don't know if this is um if this is right but i think someone told me once that the venus flytrap had evolved from the sundew or the other way around was that, um, that a random fact? Some of them are related <laughs> to others, but probably no. no I wouldn't say that. I can't remember. There is um, either fly trap or sundew is very closely related to one of the others um, mm. within the carnivorous plant family. I must have, I can't remember which one it is, but yeah. So some of them are closely related to another. Um, mm. Same for like other plant families, but I don't think it was the sundews and fly traps. But yes, yeah, some of them mm. are quite closely related. Okay, and there's ones that work underwater as well, right? Yes. <laughs> so yeah, basically you can have um, like I've got aquatic utricularias and terrariums um yeah. indoors and outside, which you can have anything underwater. I mean, even in a natural environment, those that are on the surface, you will find that they, you know, can be waterlogged for many times, especially in the winter when it floods in mm-hmm. the wild, which people again don't, don't seem to understand about the environment. Um, is you know, when it floods they still survive really happily. So, you know, it's so much to learn about these wonderful plants as well. (laughs) That's interesting. Like I um, had the opportunity to go and see some Venus flytraps growing in the wild around Wilmington in North Carolina. Yeah, I know. You've still got to come. Uh, Megan, you can come even. So um, I really want to go because, you know, North Carolina is basically where the flytrap originates from. It's the natural you know environment so for you know to go would be amazing i've seen them in the uk um a couple of times or three times a bit in both in the new forest and wales but really to to where they originate from would be amazing how do yeah. they get there do you think because i've seen sundew in wales but you're, you're talking about venus flytrap were in wales or so um basically there is some colonies in the uk where flytrap saracenia had grown so in Dorset, there was a colony of Saracenia purpurea, which yeah. thrived in the UK, but unfortunately all got dug up because they're an invasive species, obviously, when uh-huh. they're considered because they're not native to this obviously country, mm. which is a shame because they were thriving so well. And if you think about their natural habitat, many of them are almost extinct because mm-hmm. obviously they've been dug up by, you know, um, yeah. poachers. Obviously, you've got the environment as well to consider that. So, but yeah, so there was colonies of flytraps in the UK, but mm-hmm. a lot of them have been dug up. If not, they're on nature reserves for people to see. Mm-hmm. There was actually some Drosera along the Norfolk Broads last year or the year before oh, really? as well. Yeah. Um, 
So the area around Wilmington in North Carolina is a 70 mile radius and it's where native uh, Venus flytraps grow. But there's also Saracenia and loads of other stuff growing around there as well. And uh, the reason why I was saying it is because you were mentioning about the water. It's all very, very boggy. You know, there's lots of water. It does get flooded and it, they're just in the perfect environment, you know, to thrive. And when I, Jen, it was an, it was a beautiful experience to see them. Like there's areas that are um, made specifically for you to be able to walk through so you could see them. But then you can also go and venture out into the wild and see if you can try and find them as well, which is a little bit harder, obviously. But it is absolutely beautiful to see them. And there's just something really captivating about carnivorous plants, <laughs> you know, wherever they are, even if they're in a, in, in a pot at home, you know, um, having a Venus flytrap at home or a little sungy, you can't, like, you can't help but keep looking at it. Did it catch anything? You know, has it moved? Did it catch um, your fingers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did, like, have you got some tips of growing them at home? Because like you said earlier on, mm. you get your first Venus flytrap, probably going to kill it if you don't <laughs> know what to do with it. Or you might think that it's died over winter and it hasn't really. So um, have, you, have you got some tips? Yeah, <laughs> I think that's what most people think. But yeah, tips for growing them at home, please. Okay, so um, so one thing obviously I guess you know people don't understand is those found in garden centres. This is one of the hardest things about growing them and working in a garden centre <laughs> is that they you know they are sold within a heated garden centre. So for people who've never grown them or never done the research, they see them as house plants and. Mm -hmm. They unfortunately are taken home, placed on like a dark shaded windowsill or in a heated room and they they die quite quickly mm -hmm. in decline. So obviously going back to obviously North Carolina, the, where they live, they have hot, sunny summers and then they have cold, frosty winters. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people don't obviously, they think they're from the tropics, jungles, rainforests, I've heard it all. Um, mm -hmm. So for example, the flytrap, it needs that winter dormancy along with, you know, other common ones like Saracenia. They need the winter dormancy in order to survive multiple years. You can skip, say, the first dormancy or, you know, have a, have them in the summer, but then they need that winter dormancy in the winter, whereas mm -hmm. unfortunately they will decline and die. My mm -hmm. advice to people wanting to obviously grow carnivorous plants is to find out what plant you want first and to find out about it. So if you are looking for carnivorous plants to grow inside all year round, you'd be looking at like the monkey jars, which is in the pemphis, um, mm -hmm. so the subtropical or tropical species of Drosera sundews, um, all great candidates, even for terrariums, terrariums, windowsills, grow lights, anything like that. I mean, you can even grow your Venus flytrap or your pitcher plant, Saracenia, in, you know, inside all year round under grow lights if you would like mm -hmm. to. But it's knowing about dormancy requirements and where the plants originate from. Obviously, if you've got Nepenthes, they are obviously from more tropical environments. They need the humidity and the heat. So, yeah, I think growing them for me, um, it was I only got my greenhouse three years ago. So mm -hmm. the ones I had, those 15 to 20 that I had during the time without the greenhouse, they I at the time, it's quite funny actually looking back on pictures. What I thought was really healthy growing actually was not. If I look at the pictures today, I kind of cringe because of how bad the plants kind of looked. <laughs> um, so you got like your um, droopy fly trap with yellow leaves and me thinking that was great because um, you don't realise how much sun these plants have. So my greenhouse now is in a south-facing um, garden. Um, it gets basically the sunlight from the second it rises to the second it sets. So mm. that's about, you know, it could be 10, 12 hour cycle a day. Um, hence what brings out coloration and stronger leaves and PTLs on the trap mm. um, as well. So I think it's just knowing the requirements for your plant. Um, I find it really well growing them in a greenhouse because I can grow multiple species, even mm. some of the rarer plants I can grow out there. Um, I've brought in several in my winter still at the moment. It's just jam packed <laughs> for the plants for the winter. Mm -hmm. um, you know that a bit more tender that can grow outside all year but then yeah. they might need winter protection so i think it differs on which plant you want to grow but yeah mm -hmm. i think it's finding out what is going to work best for you or what you um where you know where in the house so for example you've got a windowsill you mm -hmm. want to grow a carnivorous plant look into things that will do well 
on a windowsill or mm-hmm. you know, see that you adapt to the plant or you know the plant has to come into an environment that can already be suited to so so really su- sunny windowsill is going to be venus flytrap sundew what about if you've got kind of bright indirect light so maybe on a sideboard or something what would you what would you put in a slightly shady spot so that would be nepenthe so the monkey jars mm-hmm. um the dr- okay. jugs on them or the little pinuicula, which are your butterworts, which are little okay. rosette plants with the uh-huh. sticky leaves. They're perfect for more indirect lit spots. They don't mm-hmm. like that direct light because it causes scorch from the leaves and they can't produce the dew as well. Um, so they are perfect candidates for, you know, like your west-facing, east-facing windowsill mm-hmm. or hanging in the middle of the room, say, at the back here yeah. on the wall. Okay, that's um, good to know. Yeah. I just want to ask about Venus flytrap then, because obviously they're dormant in the winter. So if we buy one in a garden centre now, that isn't a good idea. We really should be buying them during the growing season. What what would um, like if we buy them now? That plant's going to be a bit confused, right? <laughs> so basically, if you're buying this time of year, because this is the best time of year, this is the mm. time of year I go crazy <laughs> with buying mm-hmm. because I love buying the sun because they're dormant um but mm-hmm. it depends where you're buying them from um okay. so if you're getting a venus flytrap from a garden center this time of year skip dormancy because it's not going to have your dormancy based on mm-hmm. where it's been so keep it inside on mm-hmm. a windowsill under a, you know under grow light or whatever and then in spring you know you could either continue keeping it inside until next winter or then you can move it out to a greenhouse which is a little bit cooler and mm-hmm. let it adapt so it's more adjusting it to what it's good you know where you want it to grow but Mm -hmm. i'd say this is the best time of year to be growing even if obviously they're not currently dormant and you're buying them from a garden center Mm -hmm. this is the best time because you get to see a year's worth of growth Mm -hmm. rather than buying them just before dormancy so sticking them outside and then get confused god i love your passion with this you you obviously grow them from seed as well and haven't you made some of your own hybrids or have i dreamt yes that's that's something that i've been working on the last couple of years is creating my own saracenia hybrids i'd love to name one after something very close to me so Mm -hmm. yeah like us (laughs) (laughs) you could call one ellen and one michael (laughs) (laughs) i'll I'll get free then (laughs) (laughs) but that's amazing so how's how's that going then yeah, so it's really well. So, see, it, it's several generations down the line. It's obviously getting the plants to be in flower first. The Saracenia from mm-hmm. seed, the actual plant, takes about five years before it even flowers for the first time. They're very slow-growing plants from seed, hence why um, asexual propagation is a lot faster. But from seed, you get that unique mm-hmm. characteristic. So you've got two plants that have got great characters. You, you, know, you might be lucky and get something amazing and that's one of my favorite things and most rewarding thing about this hobby is growing from seed because there is that chance that you're going to get something amazing that's never been created before so unique and it's yours and you get to name it you know and then when you distribute it into the community you know with growers you know you can say that's mine and people rave about it and go oh, look at this lovely plant you know and it's come from you so that's what i'm aiming for Mm-hmm. How long do they take to grow from seed? So based on what it is, um, even like fly traps, for example, they take about four to five years until you get a mature plant. Um, sometimes, you, you know, you could, some growers will get them quicker there. There's a lot of trials recently with fertilising plant, you know, and trying different concentrations of that. Um, but even Saracenia, some will take up to six years before they are mature flowering plants. Others, mm-hmm. say, for example, subtropical drosera, several months they're weeds <laughs> they get to a point where when you grow them as extensively as i do yeah if you don't harvest the seed pods in time they scatter everywhere and that's it you've got weeds for the rest of your life uh, it's a weed i wouldn't mind <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, the best, it's the best kind of weed yeah <laughs> oh wow like i've got all these ideas now in my head i want to have a go at like sowing seeds i've never done that before for carnivorous plants i've never really grown that many i had a few on my balcony here in North Carolina, they did last a full year, and then I had a really bad mealy bug outbreak, and it seemed to kind of go everywhere. So they basically got binned. <laughs> Whoops. Anyway, what's next for you, Megan? What's coming up next? Um, so I've got my first talk. I'd say is probably the most highlight that's coming up. I've got my first talk in April Ooh. next year. Cool. Um, going to just a small gardening community club. Um, 
um, who have basically hired me to do a talk on carnivorous plants um, for growers to get inspiration of what they want to do in the spring. So I think that's the most exciting. But that's been cool. That, How do you feel about it? Good. Really excited because I've never done anything, you know, like that. I've always wanted to yeah. kind of, you know, I, I'm promoting myself at the moment, trying to get myself out there to do a talk in front of people. You know, presentations have never been my yeah. strong suit in life, but to do that kind of talk is going to be a massive step in a direction. Yeah. But you, it, it's really, it's really interesting to me that the first word you used wasn't nervous; it was excited. Yeah. It's so yeah. cool. You've got such a positive approach to all this. Yeah, of course you're you're nervous. You'll admit that. We all are. But excited is your stronger feeling, which is just brilliant, darling. Really cool. I think cool. when you're this passionate about something, you know, yeah. you, could probably, you two could probably say from experience as well, that you're so into what you do and horticulture is basically your lifeblood. Yeah. That it doesn't matter what is thrown at you. You, mm. you find a way to get over those fears because – that, yeah. You know, in new presentations mm -hmm. was terrible, but I'm more excited than nervous. But you it. have to, like, we're all, like, every time you learn from those, but if you're not in the situation, you don't get to improve or see what you did right or wrong. That's the thing. And and also, you'll, you'll start to find, and you probably know it already, like, the feeling that you get afterwards when you knew that you were really nervous, this kind of euphoria when you sit back and you're like, oh, that's cool, what's next? You know, that is just addictive. So, yeah, you got it right. Yeah, perfect. That, that's some wise words from Michael there for you, were not it? I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take whatever I can get. <laughs> oh, no. So where could listeners find out a lot more about you? Give us, uh, give us everything, social media handles, website. This is promote yourself as much as you like. <laughs> okay, so um i got my instagram account under the name of at carnivorous plant girl with underscores between um each word and same name as my youtube is carnivorous mm -hmm. plant girl as well um so there you will um on my youtube you'll be able to find obviously tutorials i do propagation videos care mm -hmm. guides greenhouse tours everything surrounding carnivorous plants you can find on there i thought you said hair guides <laughs> oh, if you want some hair guides as well, I'll, I'll add that to yeah. a video one day. I'll just <laughs> flick my hair back. <laughs> um, and then, only in the last couple of months, I have also um, created my first blog called The Carnivorous Greenhouse. So, again, based um, obviously from my YouTube, I'll be doing again um, tutorials, propagation videos, um, you know, any information is more on the personal side to me as well so any visits that I do that involve carnivorous plants um you know if I go to greenhouse visits of you know a few specialized um, carnivorous plant growers in the, um, in the UK so if I ever go to those you know I'll post that on my blog so anything you want to know about carnivorous plants then please feel free to follow me on anything like that um obviously LinkedIn as well just under my name Megan Webb um obviously I'll start posting a lot more on there networking with other growers it's lovely mm. to meet you know plant communities yeah, and LinkedIn is a real hotbed for connections as well. I think a lot of people overlook it. They think it's kind of very, they think it's like very business-like, but it's actually got a really lovely social media interface now and it's so good for connections, it really is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question. Sorry, I've got to ask it, Megan. I, I We're about to wrap up, but I, I have to just ask this question. Is it really okay to feed carnivorous plants with dead flies? Dead one. Oh God! <laughs> You're ending it on that one, are you? <laughs> um, You're in trouble, Ellen. <laughs> um, basically, like, uh, you know, um, short answer is no. Basically, so it is the movement of live insects which mm. triggers and allows the plants to trap. So a fly trap will. Basically, they can count, they can adjust, you know, to the size of the insect. So if you've got a fly and it is half the size of the trap, it will base its, you know, I don't know how they do it, but, you know, they think, basically, these plants are alive in the fact that they will judge how big that fly is and how much movement it does is how tight the trap will shut. Hence why mm -hmm. if you are feeding dead insects or, you know, dead mealworms or anything like that, then a massage, a gentle massage to the trap is needed to stimulate, you know, the trap mm -hmm. to be active in order to close around and digest the prey. Otherwise, it would just end up opening up without doing anything because the trap doesn't think anything has obviously been moving in there. Is that because you stimulate the hairs? Because there's more, the hairs need to be triggered more than once, right? 
Yeah, so the tr- right, right. and then it knows it's got something wiggly and live in there, right? <laughs> yeah, so the hairs yeah. need to be triggered at least twice, or you know, once every twenty seconds, or something like yeah. that. So the fly, uh, fly trap can count. Obviously, if something's in there, triggers all three of them, it will snap shut quite quick. But then, mm-hmm. if there's nothing moving whilst mm-hmm. the trap is shut, then it thinks it was just you know wind or something like that, or yeah. sometimes water yeah. drops can trigger them to close. Um, but obviously in a fly trap's life, it can only close that one trap three times. Otherwise, it would die. So if you are, for example, kids and garden centres that go around poking every single trap, if you used to do that three times on every trap, that plant's got no traps mm. left. So that's when, you know, you're taking all the energy, the amount of energy it takes, especially for a fly trap to close on prey, you know, is very costly to obviously what they've, yeah. you know, been adapted to. So, yes, it's, be careful with obviously what you're feeding your plants as well. Yes, good Ellen. tips. Good tips on that note. <laughs> by the way, I have never fed a Venus flytrap with a dead fly, but I do have done with I, grated cheese. But I do know <laughs> someone that has. But we will go now. Thank you so much, Megan. Uh, uh, it's been really inspirational, and uh, I think you have an awesome future in horticulture. Good luck doing your talk as well. I'm sure it's going to be amazing, and I'm definitely going to go and check out your YouTube videos for sure. So thank you so much. And thank you for having me. It's been great. It's been a pleasure. Hello, it's Julia from Parker's Patch here. And I'm hopefully going to encourage you to grow something tasty because I'm passionate about growing your own. I can hear your groan that it's far too cold outside to start thinking about growing fruit and veg. Well, if you have a warm place in your home or a propagator, now is the perfect time to sow a number of things, including tomatoes. Tomatoes need a long time to grow and mature before they are ready to fruit. So by starting them now, it allows time for good, strong roots to form. I know light is an issue if growing in the house rather than a heated greenhouse, but seedlings can become leggy and look weak. Well, there are a few tricks to counteract this. You can wrap silver foil around a piece of card and place behind the seed tray or pot growing on a windowsill. The foil will reflect natural daylight back onto the seedlings. Or you can do what I do and buy silver card cake boards, usually sold in packs of three from a certain cheap high street store. Or you could just bury the long stems when repotting by more than half. And those little tiny hairs that cover tomato stems very cleverly produce roots. If, like me, you started chilies last month in a propagator or under bubble wrap, you will need to keep an eye on them to stop them from drying out. On sunny days, I open the tiny vents in the propagator lids. It's really good to let the air circulate. Just remember to close the vents at night. Other veggies to sow this month are radishes, peas, early salads, aubergines and peppers. I love padron peppers, so I'll be starting to sow a tray of these soon. On a dry day, you can plant out onion and shallot sets. Simply nudge them into the soil. No digging is required. Sets look like immature onions, which are heat treated to eradicate diseases. A tip though, scatter some light branches or twigs over them once planted. This prevents birds from landing and pecking the sets out of the ground. Of course, if this happens, you can just pop them back into the holes, but it's five or 10 minutes spent that can be avoided. Now, if you're looking for a fun thing to grow and something to occupy children during half term, why not try to grow your very own sustainable sponge, otherwise known as a loofah? All you need is a jam jar, kitchen towel and a little water. Seeds are available nationwide and once they arrive, pop three or four into a jam jar onto moist kitchen towel. Replace the lid and leave somewhere warm, like an airing cupboard. Pop them into compost when much bigger, but you must keep them in the house or a heated greenhouse. Only when it's much warmer can you plant them outside in a sunny sheltered spot. They grow and look like cucumbers, so they will need support, but they are fun and they'll be ready for picking in the autumn. So happy growing. And if you want many more ideas, there are lots to inspire all ages in the Little Growers Cookbook, which I co-wrote last year, available for most retailers and a perfect gift for spring. Brought to you with Lava Light. 
Derived from volcanic deposits, lava light can help you to nourish and protect your plants all year round. The collection comprises eight different horticultural growing media and pest control products. So why not look out for their colourful packs, either online or in your local gardening store? Hello Prune. Hello Fig. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I had some lovely figs last night, actually. Oh, I got something so exciting to tell you. Have you heard well, of look... coloured food buffets? Have I heard of coloured food buffets? Yeah. So yeah. you go, uh, you go to like an event, and you take obviously as usual, you would take the food, but each person gets given a designated a colour. So, for example, I was designated purple, so I only took purple foods. Now, this could be. Like uh, the food or the packaging of the food as well, as long as like it displays as purple. And you kind of then, uh, and I think it started on TikTok, and you walk in with kind of like your stuff all arranged nicely in a basket, or so you can see all the purple stuff. And it was really <laughs> put together because um, my purple basket was, um, I lined the basket with sexy black velvet, and then inside were blueberries, which are obviously kind of purpley, figs, some really nice figs, some grapes, uh, balsamic salad dressing in a bottle because I also had a red purple lettuce, <laughs> Pringles, a really cool Pringles in a purple tube, uh, like some uh, iced teas in purple uh, tube. There was, oh my God, embarrassingly, cheese strings. You know this cheese, thing? Is cheese thing? string? String. Is that right? I have no Is idea. Kind of thing, and like uh, their teenage son was there, and he was like showing me how to eat. It's the most gruesomely weird food, but anyway, my <laughs> God, uh, healthy, Ellen Mary. Um, what else? Ah, oh, more purple stuff. Dairy milk—that's an obvious. Uh, another purple random drink, a Polish chocolate bar that was purple, and maybe a couple of other things, and displayed it really nicely with some purple flower tulips. That's and cool. Other, because I walked in with the purple. Then our other friend had green, so they had all green foods. And then our other friend had red, so they had a red basket. <laughs> so cool. And then you all just tucked in and ate all your coloured coded yeah. food. Oh, I know. I had some Roquefort cheese in a purple, uh, it was in a purple packaging. So. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Honestly, TikTok has a lot to answer for. <laughs> oh, what TikTok phrase have you been on? <laughs> that, <laughs> I'm just listening to you. <laughs> oh, but no, it's really, it's, it really makes you creative and kind of makes people appreciate food in a different way. So, so always these crazes seem quite throwaway and kind of you know banal. But there's always a kind of educational side to it when you when you think a bit deeper, which is pretty yeah. cool. I'd, yeah. yeah. But also, like, can't we have some fun? You know. Yeah. Like, I mean, why not? I, like, people say I, things like that. People are like, oh, it's, it's so it. silly. Or da, da, da. It's like, well, can we not just have some fun sometimes, you know? Yeah, you're Does right. it have to be serious? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. So that was cool. Anyway, you, where are you? I am in my little cottage in the UK, feeling as happy as can be after a morning on the allotment. <laughs> oh, bless you. That's got, cute. Mm, Mud under my fingernails. I was so cold that my I just wasn't really quite prepared for how cold it was going to be. And my toes were like ice. My fingers were like ice. But uh, it was just the best ever. I'm not that cold generally in the winter because I'm not a girl. But um, I find that when I ride a bike, because I'm riding a bike sometimes in London, like the little rental bikes, and that really makes your hands very cold. It's just... Yeah, you it's you, well, that's the thing. You have to be properly dressed yeah, no matter but what. That, really, I'm okay, but yeah. Yeah. But honestly, I pulled out um, the biggest parsnip I've ever grown. It's almost as really? big as my arm, and I'm going to oh, post that wow. on Instagram. It was massive. Oh, and oh all God. the leeks are doing amazing. In fact, I've probably got too many leeks, so I harvested tons, and I'm going to have to start... Uh, offering them up to other people. Oh, to read. I'll take a leak, Helen. You'll take a leak? Well, you're in oh. the car. Where are you going to do that? Well, maybe more. Than, uh, yeah, I'll take a few leaks. <laughs> On your you own. have a few leaks, yeah. And um, 
I and I cut back three uh, stalks of sprouts as well. Like, <laughs> it, and I was just thinking, like that. I haven't been there since October, but I am really well planned and prepared throughout the yeah. year because I I know I'm not going to be there over the winter, so I do plan it really, really carefully. But I haven't been there for four months, and it, there's some weed, yeah, yeah but nothing major, like literally nothing major at mm-hmm. all. And I was just thinking, like, it doesn't, na- isn't na- nature just does what it what it does? You don't yeah. have to panic about whether you can be there doing things or not. You, <laughs> you know. It's all, it was all completely fine. It's amazing. I'm not going to say, I must just say my allotment yeah. neighbour did mulch my dahlias. I spoke to him before I went away and asked and he said, mm-hmm. yeah, you would do that. So the dahlias got mulched because that was after I'd left. And also he had done a little bit of weeding for me on part of the like veggie plot side mm-hmm. as well. So I, I'm, you know, that's not without a tiny little bit of help. But overall, mm-hmm. it's, it's just... Yeah, it was awesome. So it was awesome to be down there, really. Exciting. Oh, it's amazing there's still kind of promise and crops in what looks like a barren winter landscape, isn't it? That's yeah. Like, that it'll be productive. Yeah. Yeah, and I honestly, I mean, it's lush to harvest all your fruit and veg and whatever throughout the summer. Mm. <laughs> but I think there's something really special about harvesting in the winter, yeah. you know? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Like winter veg is just like special. There was one cabbage, like the outer leaves were looking really awful, but you take them mm-hmm. off, inside was perfect. There was That's actually four, uh, uh, four or five stalks of sprites, but I took away three today. And uh, mm-hmm. all the leeks, like I didn't harvest all the leeks because there's just so many. But with the mm-hmm. parsnips, I could, I started to dig uh, like fork them up and then I couldn't stop myself because I got they were so big I wanted to see how big they all were so I dug them mm. all up and like there's just tons <laughs> so I don't know what I'm going to do with them so like soup and stuff I guess <laughs> you were so inquisitive <laughs> but it was beneath you just dug them all yeah but I really <laughs> but I was really happy because I got the biggest parsnip I've ever grown before so uh, you know you, um, can you just store those like in the soil just in a pile of soil yeah, I think you can still yeah. parsnips like you can most root veg for sure. Um, they they would have been fine, I think, all the way through to because when I come back again at the end of March, uh, mm. I think they would have been fine. But I just couldn't wait. Really, I wanted to see, and I'm so pleased that I did. <laughs> it must be like Wonderland, keep pulling them. <laughs> it was so exciting. I feel like my soul, my soul feels hot, like better just from going down the allotment for two out two or three hours yeah. today. Oh. <laughs> Well, I was just fanning about in the garden the last couple of days and like, I, I wish I had conifers because when the leaves are off the trees, it's like, it makes the gun so bare. It's just, yeah, yeah really good, um, good support for conifers in that situation. And, and obviously, like, you know how my house is like, it's overlooked by this other window and I'm just kind of like, ah. <laughs> but no, it's fine. But do you know the funniest thing? I was filming with uh, with Jen, who you know, my assistant, this morning, and she um, and we're talking about the garden, and she's like, "Oh, are you gonna like uh, jazz it up soon or something?" And I was like, "Jen, this is winter. This is what the garden <laughs> looks like." <laughs> Just like <laughs> honestly, and she's she's younger, so it's the impatience of youth, you know. But your um, how are you, your bulbs must be coming through, actually. Yeah, the bulbs are coming through. There's uh, loads and loads of um, daffodils, tulips, hyacinths. There's even uh, some alliums. And to be fair, the, the hyacinths that have come through have already started to develop flower heads, which is slightly worrying because if we do have like a, a, a heavy frost or snow, then that is... No, they'll be fine. They'll be fine. Really? Last Holland, I was in a... Literally from like, I think it's in mid-March, I was in Holland and the hyacinths were coming up. And then they, we had that unexpected cold snap with snow on top. And they're fine because they're hardy. They're perfectly hardy. And so they yeah. had snow on top and it melted and then they were fine. Yeah. So well, as long I, as it's not... Yeah, I think as long as it's yeah. not sustained cold, heavy snow, mm-hmm. that should be fine. But fingers crossed anyway. Like, yeah. they're all popping up. And um, I had to have a good weed around them. There was a ton of, like... Um, uh, annual weeds about which I've removed mm. most of and I they noticed that a lot of the... they don't die with the frost these weeds the <laughs> it's... I know you never it's oh. always the weeds that manage to survive through the cold oh, weather right. <laughs> um, 
A lot of the daffodils haven't come up, which is really odd. So I don't really know what's going on there, but there's loads from, of tulips and stuff. Second year, third year, or first year, you mean? I know, my new, I planted out new ones in September. It's still a bit early, because it still is quite early, isn't it? It's what, early Feb? Yeah, I think not yet. Why are, the, why are the tulips? Why are the tulips up oh, and not the daffodils? That. Well, I've got various things coming up, but I'm not sure if they're my new plantings or actually my repeat, my repeat performers. I'm not yeah. sure. So, but I tell you something that that people need to do that they don't realise is to water the bulbs that are in containers. Yeah. Because I made that mistake last year, and I saw um I saw a post today about watering tulips at least four times before they flower, and that is really good advice actually because you can easily forget. And think yeah. that oh goodness is all in the bulb. They don't need any intervention, but they really do. To be honest, to get the most in pots. And I saw a, a poor little hyacinth pot at a cafe today. I was with, and it was barely coming out of the crown of foliage to flower. And again, it's because it hadn't been watered. And people yeah. kind of whack these things out on tables and don't don't do that. And it's it's a crime. It's a crime against plants. No, you're right. Yeah, they do need some water for their implants. Like this time of year, when all the bulbs start coming through, everything kind of just uh, snowballs, and I love it. Yeah. I do as well. It's just the best. It's the best. It's just the best thing. And after a long winter, you know, there's no wonder why we all get excited when bulbs pop out, up, pop up, and it's the same every year. Like we have the same conversation every single year, but it's not like still the most exciting thing to see. Yeah, totally. Oh, so where are, are you now? You're in a car. Like, what? Where are you off to? Uh, I'm in Woodbridge. I'm going to see some friends later, and I've actually got um, some little. This is actually quite timely. I'm not going to pick them up. Actually, I'll break them. But we've got our carnivorous plants episode with Megan this week, and I actually yeah. have a few carnivorous plants in a bag because my thing now, like you know, I got friends. I'm of the age where my friends have different kids and blah blah blah. And I tend to, like, take gifts for the kids, like little plants. And, like, it's amazing how much they love that. And I really love to do it as well. And kind of, this is for two boys and it's, like, carnivorous plants. So you've got a Venus flytrap and a sundew. And it's just, I think that's such a cool thing to do, isn't it? <laughs> oh, that's the cutest thing. You're, like, the cool uncle that shows up <laughs> and gives them gifts. <laughs> also, like, on the other hand, it's also just really easy. <laughs> <laughs> Think about anything too complex. Oh, Venus tribe trap. That's uh, that's a tick done. <laughs> I don't, but like, but to think outside of that, I remember um, seeing my friend's uh, little daughter in Holland last summer. And I took a polka dot begonia plant because then they're kind of like, oh, you can count the count the polka dots and la la la. So that was cool. Yeah, that's so. really nice. And. You know, all the better for getting young people to love plants. So you, it's like a double whammy. You're the cool, you're the cool uncle, and you're sowing the seed. I know. I'm looking forward to seeing you next week, Ellen. I know. I'm. I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to seeing you too, as long as you're kind to me. Of course, I will be. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to Peat Free Houseplant Nursery, Winter Garden as well. So, yeah, yeah, it'll be really cool. And then yeah, a week after, really I know, like that again, that's come around really, yeah, we that's come around really quickly. So, that's on the 21st. And um, I was thinking about when I last went because I didn't come back for it last year. So, the last one I went to was yeah. in um, 2020, and it was just before lockdown where i didn't really know any of the virus stuff at all yeah. was going on and people started saying oh should we elbow bump or should we uh, like yeah. feel that and i remember thinking why why are we doing why are we why are we doing this do you know what i mean so i haven't really been since then so i'm really looking forward to going and mm. and there'll be loads of new faces because also since 2020 so many mm. more people have kind of got into horticulture yeah. and then got their accounts going on Instagram and got involved with the media. And so there'll be like a load of new faces there as well, which would be really yeah. cool. It's banging. <laughs> banging. It's banging oh, in the world. Uh, I thought of you this morning because I was what? filming some content and like, you know how we are. We're not really the type of people that rehearse or practice stuff before we do it. We just tend to go like balls deep. And I was doing some uh, kind of like tabletop co cocodama, calling them moss wraps. Moss wraps. Isn't that a cool phrase, Ella Mary? Moss yeah. wrap. And moss. um 
and I kind of like, yeah, my method was kind of like, yeah, I was learning it as a go. Do you know what I mean? And there was this moment where like the bit fell off and then this, and it was like, and like, obviously that's on film, but I won't use it. But I was just thinking, this is exactly like Ellen does the same. She just <laughs> does it. It's just, but this is the spirit of just like, like my style of learning is to learn as I do something. If someone shows me, I'm kind of crap because I need them to show me as I do it. Or if I've got written instructions, that doesn't work either. I have to do it as I do. And so this is, yeah. And I think, yeah, like sometimes you're like, oh God, why am I like this? But then also that's how we kind of learn and evolve and kind of try new things as well. So yeah, but I, I wouldn't change that about myself. But in the moment, I'm still always a bit like, oh, bloody hell, Michael, what are you doing now? <laughs> I like, I don't, do you remember when we recorded um, Plant Based oh, on TV and yeah. we were both doing loads of little like creative projects and um, oh. they were always messy, but we were just doing them there and then. And before you get started doing anything like that, you think, well, it looks so easy. Like there's no reason uh, why I can't do it. And then you start doing it. And it's like messy and you get annoyed with yourself because it's not looking quite how you want it to look. That's what oh. happened with Gabby Kusa recently. And oh. I was just like, why do I do it? Like, why do I do this? I'm not really that but good at it. I, I, and I think because maybe you're the same, I always have this strong vision of what I can create. And yeah. sometimes I can't describe it, but I can see it in my head. And, that, and that's what propels me forward, really. But sometimes just the route to get there is not always as clear as you would hope but but no that's, no it's cool moss wraps moss wraps remember where you heard it first okay i'm wondering if we should manage our expectations better when we next do a creative project no because that stifles creativity get in a muddle get in a muddle is what i advise my wabby <laughs> coos definitely got stifled in creativity yeah. somewhere along the line it looks Sorry. poop <laughs> No, I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> I need, I'm going to get some, when I go back to the US, I'm going to get a couple more plants and put yeah. them in and well, you, make it, it look a little bit. Oh. Pardon? It might have been a clever angle. <laughs> no, honestly, it's just not that good. In fact, the plants I got, I didn't like. And then I ended up putting house plant cuttings in it as well. So I used <laughs> pothos and ferns in it because I just didn't like what I'd got. So <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Oh, Ellen, honestly. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you and having some podcast brainstorms as well because we kind of, uh, we want to brainstorm like different different things we could do, different people we could interview. So, of course, that, dear listeners at home, is also open to you guys to suggest as well. So, yeah, I'm feeling like uh, uh, we need a gentle pivot, I think, Ellen Mary. Don't you think? I agree. Like, we've been going uh, since... 2018, which is pretty mm. epic, I've got to say. Um, I, and I wonder what our anniversary is. Yeah, I don't, Ooh, really, I don't, I don't know what date we released it. Um, I've oh, got. Go. A, it is it like a February? I don't know. It we might have been out. February. We should definitely find out. Yeah. We should, because if that's if it is, that's five years. I'll, yeah. I'll have to. I'll check when the first episode was, but. Yeah. Um, I think you and I, yeah. you and I are like, we do like change and to pivot and to try all yeah. other stuff. And we don't ever like anything to like really stay the same. So we were having mm. this conversation about, you know, what can we do with it next? And I think that's like really cool and why we've been able to carry on going for so long, perhaps. Mm. And yeah, yeah I does. think if anyone has any ideas or anything they think they'd love to hear or see, us do on the podcast or elsewhere then let us know definitely yeah cool. i messaged you something the other day we might want to keep that confidential still for now i don't know but i think that could be nice you know yeah, yeah. i Not agree podcasts, you know ellen mary <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, well, a good a idea. Idea, you know <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so brainstorm central. Yeah, okay. So we're going to brainstorm next week. That's exciting. Um, yeah, and like I have really enjoyed doing this particular series as well. 
we seem to like go through the series really quick. So this one is was obviously Megan, the carnivorous plant. Mm, mm. Then we've got like Chris Young coming up. We've got um, advice from the RHS. Um, something else, I think. But the series run it goes so quickly, and I, I can't just can't afford it. Uh, batches here and there, which works really nicely because then. Yeah, that works geographically or kind of works uh, nicely when we can fit them in. And yeah, so it feels like we, we get them in the bag quite soon, which is cool. Yeah. Because put them out at the right times that mean a lot to the listeners as well. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah mm. very cool indeed. Thanks so much. Oh. That was a plant-based podcast appreciation moment. <laughs> <laughs> Bless your cotton socks. <laughs> oh, dear. So what are you going to be doing? I bet you're still jet-lagged, right? I know, I'm fine today. Yesterday I was like a zombie. Like, I, I literally uh, couldn't function. It's ridiculous. Um, uh, I And I decided I don't ever want to do night flights again until I'm rich enough to fly business so I can lay down. <laughs> uh, so oh, that, no. that might be never. i for a long time now, and it's just that that weird upright sleepingness is just... Oh, oh, it makes me shiver. <laughs> yeah, it is grim, and I get really restless legs, and I can't put my legs up, and then I get up and walk around, and then I'll watch something, and then I'll try and snooze, but I can't because I don't know, I'm just rubbish, so I don't sleep. So there's no sleep, and then there's jet lag. Anyway, so yesterday even was a right uh, pill or something like that. No, even what? Sorry, even with a sleeping pill or something. No? I I wouldn't take Not a sleeping would... pill. I think. <laughs> on a flight, I wouldn't take a slight sleeping pill. I always feel like I need to know what's going on. That won't surprise you. Um, I did one day, many years ago, I took a flight to Kuala Lumpur and someone gave me Valium and I yeah. literally slept for 12 hours. Mm. And when I woke up, I was like, oh my God, we literally just landed. <laughs> it was a, it hey, wasn't that's it. quite an amazing feeling though, yeah. <laughs> but, um, I didn't really like the idea that anything could have happened and I wouldn't even have known about it. So, um... I'm probably going to wake up, darling. <laughs> I don't think going to sleep through something like that, are you? <laughs> I don't know. I might... I maybe prefer to sleep through it, actually. I don't really know. Anyway, um... And then this week, really, it's mainly here to see my parents um, because, you know, they're getting a little bit older now, dare I say. And, um... <laughs> You know, so I like to try and spend as much time with them as possible. I've got loads of allotment yeah. stuff to do, a couple of days' work and the press event, catching up with some friends. Um, you must also, have the longest commute to an allotment of anyone. <laughs> yeah. I come all the way from the US just to weed the allotment. <laughs> oh, dear. Hey, and, I have to um, tell you, you might, uh, you might find it in US. Dream water was... Uh, I used to drink that when I was uh, coming across to US. And it's like it's sort of a liquid, I think it's like sleeping tablet in liquid form, but it used to be wonderful. And the same would happen to me. I would like wake up startled when we land on the tarmac <laughs> at the destination. Are you sure you didn't just take some cannabis? <laughs> no, 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 no. It was perfectly, what's it, what's it? <laughs> okay, I believe you. Well, yeah, uh, fine. like the first days are right off, but I always know that if I get a night flight, so whatever. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's all good. And then like I get back and there's piles of post and 90% is rubbish, but you can always guarantee there'll be one thing that I've missed or is really bad news, like news, as in like <laughs> somebody got a speeding fine driving my car uh, or, or uh, this time, <laughs> this time I hadn't paid my water bill, but I didn't even know I had a water bill and um, they were... <laughs> They were literally sending in the, I don't know, not the, not yeah. the bailiff, but sending it to like a credit really? thing. And I was like, I, I actually messaged, I messaged them on the portal saying, I signed up for paperless billing. So why yeah. are you sending paper chase letters to the house when I signed up for paperless billing? Like, so I literally paid that 10 minutes after I walked through the door. Like, had I known, I would have paid it months ago, but I didn't know. So there's always some silly little drama like that that goes on. Uh, oh, my God. <laughs> the other day, I was clearing out some papers, and I found, a like, a tax refund from HMRC for, like, £40 as a cheque or something. Woo. I don't know how I missed that, and I never paid it in. But I'm figuring, like, 
this is not valid anymore because it was like four years ago. <laughs> it's definitely not. I think checks have six month lifespan, something like yeah, that. Yeah, I don't know. So it's something that like, well, I'm hoping they just like balanced my account somewhere, somehow, and they didn't just keep it. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's worth the trauma of trying to chase it up. <laughs> to be I would think they probably, that is like paying it back to you is how they yeah. balance it. But if you don't cash it, that's your issue, I guess. I, really, I don't really know. But I is, don't is like, that, I haven't had any. To sort it, so I probably won't. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Unfortunately, I didn't have any rebates on the doorstep, but yeah. a ton of seeds. So like millions of seed packets and I got yeah. the sweet seeds for the year. They arrived. I get them from a place. Oh, got them. I get them from a place called Owl's Acre Sweet Peas. So uh-huh. I'm going Winter Sunshine, Spanish Dancer, and a Beaujolais this year, which I've never grown Ooh. before. Um, to the- and two of those are Spencer Sweet Peas, which is a, which are the ones that um, are often used for show sweet peas because they have like the lovely pork <laughs> straight um, stems, which is really cool. So, yeah, I've got tons of seeds to sort, and it's a busy time of year. Oh, how wonderful, Melanie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I'm really tempted to go in this garden centre I'm sat outside, so mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of ways to end the call. That's just, like, really rude, but, like, we could just end the call, basically, right now. <laughs> well, you know, it might close soon. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, it's been a pleasure. I'll chat with you next week. A wonder crumb, absolutely. In Technicolor, glorious Technicolor. Maybe. Well, well, no, you you are in colour in real life, right? You're not black. But I'm in colour here also. I mean, I'm not going to wear a dream coat or anything. (laughs) I'm going to see. Don't be late, is my advice. Oh my goodness! Enjoy the garden centre. Thanks, babe. The music for the Plant Based podcast is part of the song Grow by Mikey James, and our editor is Gareth Patch of Semi Echo. Mm-hmm.